My name is Alexia Cortez, and I am part of the government affairs team for PPIC. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Public Policy Institute of California, or PPIC, as we are widely known, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit public policy think tank with offices here in Sacramento and San Francisco. For today's program, we are going to hear from PPIC researcher Alyssa Dykman. She will outline the findings from the latest PPIC statewide survey on Californians and the environment. This is one of the few specialized um, topic surveys that PPIC pulls on throughout the year. This survey was supported with funding from the RJ and Francis F. Miller Foundation, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, and the Flora Family Foundation. We would like to thank them for their support for this important work. We would also like to acknowledge the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle for their support of this event and also today's lunch. A few things before we begin. You should have received a handout at registration that contains some of the key findings that Alyssa will highlight today in our program. The full, the full survey report, as well as the briefing slides, are now available on our website at ppic.org. After today's presentation, we should have plenty of time for audience Q&A. We just ask that you please wait for the microphone. That way, we can capture your questions on our videotape. Our next event will take place here next week on August 8th, and we will hear from PPIC Research Fellow Julian LaFortune, and a panel of experts will discuss the findings of, a, of the latest PPIC report on school resources and the local control funding formula. You can sign up for that also on our website. Later today, you will receive a brief event survey and we ask that you please take a few moments to fill that out because we are genuinely interested in your feedback. And finally, please silence or turn off your cell phones. And now let's begin today's program. Please help me to welcome up my colleague, PPIC researcher, Alyssa Dykman. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. Um, thank you, Alexia, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for taking the time to join us today. This is a full house and this is very exciting. Um, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge the other co-authors of this report. Uh, that includes PPIC President, CEO, and Survey Director Mark Baldessari, Associate Survey Director Dean Bonner, and Fellow Research Associate Rachel Ward. So before we be begin, I just want to preview um, what we'll be looking at today. Um, so first, I'm going to go through a bit about PPIC statewide surveys, our mission, and our methodology for this report. And then we'll dive into the two main sections of the report, uh, the first being public perceptions. So that will include uh, approval ratings of our state and federal elected officials um, and opinions um, surrounding environmental topics, including wildfires, water, air pollution, and coastal and ocean issues. Uh, this will then be followed by policy preferences, uh, where we'll look at Californians' um, opinions when it comes to climate and energy policy, as well as uh, the 2020 election. Um, so this will be followed by some concluding remarks. And then, as Alexia mentioned, we'll have plenty of time uh, at the end for Q&A. Um, and sort of pulling a line from uh, Mr. Biden yesterday, please go easy on me, kids. <laughs> okay, so first, an introduction to PPIC uh, statewide surveys. So the mission of the survey is to provide timely, relevant, nonpartisan data uh, on political, social, and economic opinions um, of Californians. We hope this will help inform uh, and improve state policymaking, raise awareness, and encourage discussion. Since 1998, we have conducted over 170 uh, general, uh, regional, and issue specific, such as the environment, uh, over which we've uh, 
spoke with over 350,000 Californians. Uh, subsequently, we have a large database um, of questions we've asked in the past, and a lot of what we uh, do and what we'll see here today is uh, make comparisons to what we've seen in the past. So this survey in particular uh, is our Californians in the Environment Survey. Uh, this is our 19th annual survey. Uh, we've been conducting uh, these surveys uh, pretty much every July since 2000. Uh, again, I want to thank the funders uh, for their generous and continued support uh, of this survey. So to get into details of sort of how we did this survey. So it was all conducted during the period of July 14th to the 23rd, uh, we conducted live telephone interviews, uh, and that included 70% conducted via cell phone and 30% via landline. These interviews were conducted in either Spanish or English, depending on the respondents' preferences. Uh, we spoke to over 1,700 California adults, uh, including over uh, 1,000 that we considered likely voters. So the margin of error for our all adult sample was 3.4% and for our likely voters, 4.4%. Um, and as I mentioned before, this survey emphasized topics on the environment um, and there's a lot of good stuff in here. So we should just get right into it. So what we do with our environment surveys um, is ask about approval overall, as well as approval of how the elected officials are handling uh, environmental issues. And as you can see here, there are some similarities between how the approval overall and how the environmental issue handling is going on. But you may also notice that there are some large differences between how Californians view our statewide elected officials and our federal elected officials. Um, so today, looking uh, at our state elected officials, uh, we find that just under half of Californians approve of Governor Newsom overall, as well as his handling of environmental issues. Uh, the governor's uh, overall approval is in line with what we've seen since the beginning of this year, hovering at around 45%. Um, for the governor's approval, as well as his handling of environmental issues, uh, we find that more than six in 10 Democrats, four in 10 independents, and two in 10 Republicans approve. Uh, across regions, about four in 10 approve, uh, with his approval highest in his home area of the San Francisco Bay Area. With respect to the California legislature, we find that about four in 10 uh, overall approve, as well as its handling of environmental issues. And this is similar to what we've seen uh, this year, as well as in previous years. Across regions, a majority of Bay Area residents approve of the legislature compared to fewer elsewhere. Whereas when we're looking at our federal elected officials, approval remains uh, far lower and about three in 10 approve of President Trump appro approval rating and about slightly fewer approve of his handling of environmental issues. For both the President and uh, US Congress, uh, approval is similar to earlier this year as well as last July. So today about one in 10 Democrats three in 10 independents and eight in 10 Republicans approve of President Trump. And his approval increases as age rises and men are uh, more likely than women to approve. Meanwhile, Congress has lower overall approval ratings among Californians than the president. Uh, today, about one in four approve of Congress in its handling of environmental issues, with at least half across political parties, regions, and demographic groups disapproving. Uh, during the period when we were fielding this survey, uh, the Gallup national polls um, had presidential approval at 44% and Congress at 17%. So Californians were less likely to approve of Trump and slightly more likely to approve of Congress. So now turning to a series of questions on global warming. So as you can see here, we've been tracking this question um, more than a decade and of which we have a national comparison from with Gallup. 
So the question is when the effects of global warming will begin to happen. And the response categories range from they already happening to they will never happen. So looking at nationwide results and our statewide results, uh, we see that Californians have always been close or ahead of adults nationwide, saying the effects of global warming are happening now. Uh, today, about six in 10 Californians uh, and adults nationwide say it's happening. Uh, in California, majorities across regions and demographic groups say the effects have already begun. Uh, and across political parties, eight in 10 Democrats, six in 10 independents, and four in 10 Republicans say it is happening. Uh, more so, though notably, one in three Republicans do say the effects will never happen. So we also asked about the threat of global warming to the economy and quality of life for California's future. And, and when we asked this, we found three in four Californians say it is a very serious or somewhat serious of a threat. Uh, and this includes, as you see on the figure, 57% of adults um, say that it is a very serious threat. Today, Democrats are three times as likely as Republicans uh, to say that global warming is a very serious threat. Across racial and ethnic groups, African Americans and Latinos are more likely than Asian Americans and whites to say the threat is very serious. And as you will see on some of the slides moving forward, uh, African Americans and Latinos tend to have higher levels of uh, concern about environmental issues than whites and Asian Americans. Um, a sil similar pattern emerges with gender and age differences. Uh, women and younger Californians are more likely than men and older Californians to say it is a very serious threat. So now we'll, we'll look at some possible impacts of global warming in California, including rising sea levels, more severe heat waves, and more severe wildfires. So when it comes to rising sea levels, Seven in 10 Californians say they are very or somewhat concerned. Similar shares of coastal and inland residents hold this view. And Californians today are slightly more likely than those when we last asked this question in 2017 to hold this view. In regards to severe heat waves, three in four Californians are very or somewhat concerned Majorities across regions and demographic groups are concerned, and regionally, Los Angeles residents are the most likely to say they are concerned. For both of these two areas, Democrats and independents are about twice as likely as Republicans to say they are concerned. And finally, when it comes to more severe wildfires, uh, we find that nearly all of Californians say they are very or somewhat concerned, and a record high share, 71%, uh, say they are very concerned. This is a notable uptick um, of those saying very concerned uh, since last year, uh, nearly 10 percentage points. And unlike rising sea levels in more severe heat waves, majorities across parties say they are concerned. Uh, regionally, about seven in 10 say they are very concerned with those in the Bay Area the most likely to say this. And women and younger Californians, again, are more likely than men and older Californians to say they are very concerned. So given that we're coming off of uh, California's deadliest and most destructive uh, wildfire year in history, um, with notable fires like the Camp Fire, the Car Fire, and the Mendocino Complex fires, um, do residents think that global warming has contributed? Uh, the survey says yes, uh, with more than 6 in 10 Californians saying global warming has contributed to wildfires. This includes eight in 10 Democrats, six in 10 independents, uh, compared to about one in four Republicans. While at least half across regions think global warming has contributed, residents of the Bay Area and Los Angeles are the most likely to hold this view. Uh, and notably, residents in these regions were greatly affected by the fires I mentioned just a bit ago. Uh, additionally, uh, majorities across demographic groups say it is contributed, and Latinos and African Americans are more likely than Asian Americans and whites to hold this view. 
So earlier this year, PG&E filed for bankruptcy protection uh, in the wake of last year's fires. Uh, this has been one of the most controversial and consequential issues facing the new governor. Um, so taking this into account um, and bracing for the now year-round wildfire season, uh, Governor Newsom recently championed uh, a bill early this summer that established a wildfire insurance fund. So the fund will be paid for evenly by utility investors and ratepayers, um, of which will cover uh, half, or the ratepayers are not going to be paying any more. Basically, it is an extension of a tax that was set to expire um, in 2021, and now this extension has been extended to 15 years. So we foreseeably should not see any rises here. Uh, Democrats are twice as likely as Republicans to be in favor of this spending plan, uh, while independents are more divided. Regionally, majorities are in support of the spending plan, with support much higher in the Bay Area than elsewhere. So now turning to a related topic, uh, water. So following the very destructive and devastating wildfire season, uh, the state had record-setting precipitation rates. Um, it was a very wet winter, and earlier this year, the U.S. Drought Monitor declared that California was drought-free uh, for the first time since 2011. Uh, so with this in mind, when asked whether the supply of water is a big problem, somewhat of a problem, or not much of a problem in their part of California, we find that one in three residents say it is a big problem, and an additional one in three say it is somewhat of a problem in their part of the state. Notably, uh, four in 10 residents say it is not a problem. And as you can see here on the slide, uh, the share of Californians saying water supply is a big problem has fallen over the last several years. Um, in fact, it has dropped 18 points since we last asked this uh, last July, and it is down 40 points uh, from a record high in September of 2015 during the drought. Uh, today, fewer than four in 10 across parties, regions, and demographic groups uh, say the supply of water is a big problem in their part of the state. So in, in addition to water supply, uh, how do Californians feel about water quality? So when asked about the pollution of drinking water, 58% of Californians think this is a more serious health threat than in lower income areas than other areas in their part of the state. Similar shares held this view when we last asked this in 2016. Uh, today, six in 10 Democrats and independents and one in three Republicans think the pollution of drinking water is more problematic in lower income areas. Regionally, this perception is most prevalent in Los Angeles, uh, with seven in 10 residents holding that view. As the figure displays, uh, the share saying pollution of drinking water is a more serious threat declines with rising income. And across racial and ethnic groups, we find that African Americans and Latinos are more likely than Asian Americans and whites to hold this view. So while most Californians have safe, reliable drinking water, uh, water contamination in dry wells um, are persistent problems in some poor and rural parts of the state. Uh, in recognition of this ongoing issue, uh, the governor and legislature directed $130 million from the state's budget uh, this year for a clean drinking water fund. The money for this fund uh, will be allocated from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which are revenues from the state's cap and trade program. More than, um, when asked about the spending plan, about seven in 10 Californians are in favor, and more than six in 10 across demographic groups and regions are in favor. Again, support is higher among younger Californians, as well as African Americans and Latinos, than among older Californians and Asian Americans and whites. Uh, there is a notable partisan divide with eight in 10 Democrats, seven in 10 independents uh, in favor of the spending plan uh, compared to 45% of Republicans. So now turning to air pollution, 
Uh, when asked whether air pollution is a big problem, somewhat of a problem, or not a problem in their part of the state, uh, over half of Californians say it is a big or somewhat of a problem, while four in 10 say it is not a problem. As you can see in the figure here, there are wide differences across regions with four in 10 residents in Los Angeles and about one in three in the Central Valley in the Inland Empire to say air pollution is a big problem, while only one in 10 say the same in the Bay Area, in Orange, and San Diego. Across racial and ethnic groups, African Americans are the most likely to say uh, air pollution as a big problem, followed by Asian Americans, Latinos, and whites. Notably, renters uh, are more likely than homeowners to say air pollution is a big problem in their part of the state. And across parties, one in three Democrats, one in four independents, and two in 10 Republicans say air pollution is a big problem. Okay. Now getting at a more environmental health and environmental justice related question. Uh, so when asked if air pollution is a very serious, somewhat serious, not too serious, or not at all serious health threat, uh, to themselves and their immediate family, we find that about half of residents say it is a very serious or somewhat serious of a threat. Findings were nearly identical when we asked this last in 2016. And today, the share of adults holding this view is highest in the Central Valley and Los Angeles, with about three in 10 residents in these areas um, saying very serious. Across racial and ethnic groups, uh, we see that African Americans are the most likely to see air pollution as a serious health threat. And across income groups, lower earning Californians are more likely than higher earning Californians to hold this view. So now, given that it's Shark Week, um, we find that it's appropriate that we ask several questions related to California's ocean and coastal areas. Um, so nearly all of Californians say the condition of the ocean and beaches is very important to the state's economy and quality of life. However, Californians, um, many are concerned about issues facing your coastline. For most, when it comes to plastics and marine debris, nearly 7 in 10 Californians say this is a big problem along the part of the coast closest to them. Uh, this is particularly notable, um, you know, given recent news, I think earlier this week, a major hotel group, uh, IHG, announced that they will be getting rid of mini shampoo bottles and conditioner bottles and similar items. And last year, there has been a movement for a plastic straw ban, and who knows what's next. Uh, so perhaps Californians and the industries are picking up on this. Uh, majorities across demographic groups uh, see plastics and marine debris as a big problem. And indeed, strong majorities across regions view this as a big problem, with those in Los Angeles, around 73% of residents in LA, uh, the most likely to hold this view. Across parties, 8 in 10 Democrats, 7 in 10 Independents, and 4 in 10 Republicans say it is a big problem. Now, with respect to other issues, uh, so looking at urban development harming wildlife habitats and endangered species, we find that four in 10 say it is a big problem along the coast. An additional um, three in 10 say it is somewhat of a problem. Uh, majorities of Latinos and African Americans and four in 10 Asian Americans and one in three whites uh, hold this view. And finally, when it comes to commercial overfishing, uh, we find that 35% of Californians say it is a big problem, and an additional 35% say it is somewhat of a problem. Uh, these findings for commercial overfishing were nearly identical um, to when we last asked this back in 2006. And again, residents in Los Angeles are the most likely to hold this view as well as across racial and ethnic groups, African-Americans, and Latinos. Okay, so now that we've looked at uh, various issues related to the environment, we'll now turn to policy preferences of Californians, uh, the first being how Californians view uh, the state's leadership on climate change. 
So when it comes to climate change and en energy policy, uh, it is evident that California's political leaders and the federal government continue to move in very different directions. Uh, I believe earlier this spring, I think California had filed over two dozen lawsuits against the federal government when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, accordingly, we asked Californians whether they favor or oppose the state government making its own policies separate from the federal government uh, to address the issue of global warming. And what we find is that solid majorities of adults and likely voters favor having the state making separate policies. These findings are similar to what we found last year when we last asked this question. And since we first asked this question in 2005, more than half of adults have favored the state government making separate policies. We're also coming off two notable events in the last couple of months. Uh, the first being the Global Climate Action Summit, which was held uh, in San Francisco by Governor Jerry Brown. Um, and the 2018 midterm elections, uh, which saw us take on a new governor. Uh, subsequently, we thought it was important to gauge how Californians feel uh, about their state playing a prominent role in the climate change policy arena. So today we find that eight in 10 Californians say it is important that the state acts as a leader, uh, including over half that say it is very important. Uh, similar patterns emerge for both questions among parties in which majorities of Democrats and independents are in favor of the state making separate policies and saying that it's important that California acts as a leader, while less than three in 10 Republicans favor state action and say it's very important that the state acts as a leader. So now turning to specific policies. Um, so CARB or the California Air Resource Board um, announced last year that the state had reduced greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels uh, two years in advance of the 2020 goal set by AB 32, uh, which was a goal that strong majorities of Californians supported in our surveys from 2006 when it was passed uh, to 2016. Uh, in 2016, policymakers passed SB 32, uh, which set a new goal of further reducing greenhouse gas emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Uh, so when asked about this goal, uh, two in three Californians are in favor, including eight in 10 Democrats, two in three independents, and one in three Republicans. Uh, support for SB 32 was similar last July. And across racial and ethnic groups, Asian Americans are the most likely to be in favor, followed by Latinos, African Americans, and whites. And looking across demographic groups, we see that more than six to 10 across regions, uh, as well as age, education, gender, and income groups are in favor. So we looked, also looked at another policy, um, which was enacted by former Governor Brown uh, last year leading up to the Global Climate Action Summit, uh, which requires that 100% of the state's electricity to be generated by renewable energy sources by 2045, including 50% by 2026. Uh, I think notably, 34% of California's electricity was derived from renewable sources in 2018, uh, which represents a four point increase from the previous year. Uh, so today when asked about SB 100, most Californians, including eight in 10 Democrats, seven in 10 independents, and one in three Republicans, support the 100% renewable goal. Strong majorities across regions are in favor as well as across demographic groups. When asked in order to reduce global warming, uh, would you be willing or not willing uh, to pay more for electricity generated by renewable sources, uh, such as solar or wind energy, um, we find that half of Californians say they are willing to pay more. Uh, this is similar to what we have asked uh, in what we found in previous years. Um, although just to note that this does not put a numeric number on exactly how much they'd be willing to pay. Uh, there is a wide partisan divide uh, with two and three Democrats, half of independents, and three in 10 Republicans say they are willing. 
And willingness also varies by region, with a high of 64% in the Bay Area to a low of 43% in the Central Valley. So now when it comes to uh, specific proposals to help uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we find that most Californians are in favor. Uh, notably, four of the world's major automakers, manufacturers, uh, BMW, Ford, Volkswagen, and Honda, um, and the state announced last week that they had reached an agreement on higher fuel efficiency standards for new cars. Um, and this was countering efforts by the Trump administration uh, to restrict the state's ability to set such standards. So when asked if uh, they favor policies that encourage local governments to change land use and tra transportation planning so that people could drive less, we find that three in four Californians are in favor. Similarly, three in four Californians uh, are in support of automakers um, being required to further reduce uh, emissions of greenhouse gases from new cars. Today, more than two in three across regions and demographic groups favor both proposals. Uh, and both proposals elicit a strong partisan divide, uh, with Democrats being about twice as likely as Republicans to favor both policies. So we also have a couple of questions on the impact impacts of the state's climate policies, um, including whether California doing things to reduce global warming in the future would impact jobs um, and impact gas prices at the pump. So today we find that about half of Californians say state action would lead to more jobs and another 21% say it would not affect the number of jobs. Since 2010, uh, more jobs has always been the most common response, and today it is the most common response uh, across regions, racial and ethnic groups, age, education, and income groups. Democrats are much more likely than independents and Republicans to say this. And while relatively few Californians expect state action on global warming to have a negative impact on jobs, uh, majorities do expect state action uh, would cause gasoline prices to increase at the pump. Similar to last year, more than half of Californians say that they would expect gas prices to increase. This includes at least half across regions and parties although Democrats are less likely than independents and Republicans uh, to say that state action would lead to an increase in gas prices. Okay, now turning to a topic that majorities of Californians have heard a little or nothing about, which is cap and trade. Uh, so in fact, today we find that a record low share have heard at least a little and a record high share have heard nothing at all about cap and trade. Uh, nonetheless, after hearing a brief description of the state's cap and trade system, uh, we find that 53% of Californians are in favor and one in three are opposed. Today, a strong majority of Democrats are in favor compared to about one in three Republicans and independents are more divided on this issue. Majorities across racial and ethnic groups are in favor, and regionally, support is highest in the Bay Area, followed by Los Angeles, the Central Valley, the Inland Empire, and our San Diego. College graduates are also more likely than those without a college degree to be in favor, and support for the state's cap and trade program declines with rising age. And then another fun fact is, among those who have heard nothing about the cap and trade system, 53% are in favor after hearing a brief description. So there you go. Uh, now in regards to ocean and coastal policies, uh, so we asked the question we've been tracking for over a decade now, and that's whether Californians favor or oppose allowing more oil drilling off the coast. Uh, notably, earlier this year, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, voted to block the Department of Interior from seeking funding to pursue new offshore oil drilling off the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, including California. Uh, so when asked about allowing more drilling off the coast, we find that 28% of adults are in favor, whereas 67% are opposed. These findings are similar to what we found last July, 
And across parties, an overwhelming majority of Democrats and a strong majority of independents are opposed, compared to about 40% of Republicans. Uh, majorities across regions are also opposed, with residents in the Bay Area the most likely to hold this view. And women are also more likely than men to oppose more drilling off the coast. Um, so in stark contrast to the low levels of support for allowing more oil drilling, um, there are relatively high levels of support for allowing wind power and wave energy projects off the coast. Uh, in fact, 72% of adults are in favor of wind power and wave energy projects, while only 19% are opposed. More than 6 in 10 across age, education, gender, and income groups are in favor, and regionally, again, residents in the Bay Area are the most likely to be in favor. Uh, notably though, unlike the partisan divide on oil drilling, uh, we find that eight in 10 Democrats and independents and two in three uh, Republicans support allowing uh, wind power and wave energy projects. And among those who oppose oil drilling off the coast, 71% are in favor of allowing wind power and wave energy projects. Okay, so now turning to an event that some people are talking about. Um, so that's the 2020 elections. Uh, so with the general election uh, over a year away and the primary a mere seven months away, so just in case everybody knows, mark your calendars for March 3rd. Um, so we find uh, that eight in 10 likely voters uh, say the presidential candidate's positions on the environment are important in determining their vote. Democratic likely voters are far more likely than independents and Republicans to say that positions on the environment are very important. Latino likely voters are also more likely than whites uh, and those in other racial and ethnic groups to hold this view. And I note on our reporting um, for our racial and ethnic groups for likely voters um, is that our sample sizes for Asian Americans and African Americans are too small for separate analyses, um, and they are included in our other racial ethnic group category. Uh, we also find that younger Californians, about 50%, uh, are more likely than older Californians to say the environment is very important in determining their vote. Okay, so the next two slides, um, show our findings from likely voters who are registered Democrats or independents who lean Democratic. Um, there was over 700 of these uh, individuals in our survey of over 1,700, so keep that in mind. Uh, so first we come to the Green New Deal. Uh, earlier this week, uh, our Senator Kamala Harris and U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, unveiled legislation that would be the first step uh, toward implementing the Green New Deal. Uh, so when asked about how important the candidates' positions are on the policy proposed by some members of Congress called the Green New Deal, we find that three in four likely voters uh, who are registered Democrats or independents who lean Democratic um, say it is very or somewhat important. Latinos are much more likely than whites and those in other racial and ethnic groups to say it is very important. And again, we find younger Californians are more likely than older Californians to say it is important in determining their vote. So finally, turning to the slide I'm sure you all have been waiting for, um, and which we find appropriate following the last two nights of debates. Um, when likely voters who are registered Democrats or independents who lean Democratic are asked an open-ended question about their candidate choice in the 2020 presidential primary, we find that 19% named Kamala Harris, 15% named Elizabeth Warren, 12% named Bernie Sanders, 11% named Joe Biden, and 5% named Pete Buttigieg. Uh, candidates listed here are those polling at 5% or higher. And notably, one in four likely voters say they don't know. Uh, not too surprising, given the long list of candidates. Uh, and women are more likely than men to say they don't know. Uh, Harris, Biden, and Buttigieg have more support among older voters uh, than younger voters, while Warren and Sanders have more support among younger voters than older voters. 
Uh, in a July ABC News Washington Post national poll, who also asked Democrats and Democratic leaning independents in an open ended question, found Biden uh, at 25% in the lead, uh, followed by Sanders, Harris, and Warren. Um, and 19% were undecided in that poll. But of course, there's many things that go on, and the debates have surely changed people's minds somehow. So let me wrap up and then bring up some key points, and then we can open it up for some questions. So in the wake of devastating fires over the past few years, we find a record high share of residents are very concerned about more severe wildfires as an impact of global warming. Uh, this view is held by majorities of residents uh, across regions and demographic groups. In light of these concerns, we find that majorities of Californians, um, including majorities across regions, favor the new wildfire insurance fund. Following a very rainy winter uh, and California being declared drought free for the first time since 2011, uh, we find that one in three residents say water supply is a big problem. Although majorities view pollution of drinking water as a more serious problem in lower income communities and support the creation of a clean drinking water fund. Uh, an overwhelming majority of Californians say the condition of the ocean and beaches is very important to the economy and quality of life for California's future. Uh, nonetheless, residents are concerned about issues that are affecting our coastline, including seven in 10 that say plastics and marine debris are a big problem. When it comes to climate change perceptions and policies, there are uh, wide partisan differences on the matter and what the state should do about it. And finally, environmental issues will be important in the 2020 presidential presidential election, and looking ahead to the Democratic primary next March, we find that Harris, Warren, Sanders, and Biden are the front runners among Democratic and Democratic-leaning voters. Okay, thank you all. And now I'd like to open up to questions. But please wait for a mic to come around. Okay, so let me ask you something. I also in your survey, when you talked about offshore oil drilling, was that, when you did that up and down the coast, did, was it different from Northern California, Central California, and Southern California? Yeah, so I can actually tell you. So majorities across regions uh, are opposed, and then we also break down our findings into inland and coastal residents, um, and that also includes North and South Coast, um, as well as inland. Um, so when it comes to offshore oil, we, yeah, we did still find that majorities about more than two and three across the board are opposed and there weren't any significant differences there. Yeah. Jeff Tardigia, um, related to your wildfires, uh, next series of questions I hope you will ask is about insurance and flood because it appears to be enormous cost of reconstruction. Yeah, I agree. That's something definitely we will need to consider moving forward. Yeah, wildfire insurance, I know, is definitely a very pertinent topic, as well as earthquake insurance, too. So you never know. Hi. I'm one of the many state workers that work on a uh, cap-and-trade program, <laughs> or a program nice. funded by cap-and-trade, yeah. which apparently no Californians know about. So yep. would you be willing to <laughs> share, or is it available on your website somewhere, what is this short description that you guys use for explaining to people what cap and trade is, um, such that you know half of them decide that it's a good thing. That they yeah. Like. <laughs> so you can find that information online as well as cross tabs of our demographic groups and regions. But this was the question: uh, in the system called cap and trade, the California state government issues permits limiting the amount of greenhouse gases companies can put out. Companies that do not use all their permits can sell them to other companies. The idea is that many companies will find ways to put out less greenhouse gases because that will be cheaper than buying permits. Do you favor or oppose the system? Hey, uh, hey Alyssa. Kate Gordon, thanks for this. Um, just a sample size question. It, it's, I mean, this is a huge state, and 1,700 people seems really small for a sample size across all of the regions you're looking at. And just interested in, without too much complicated methodology, 
whether that's rising over the years, how you're thinking about that, um, do you feel good about that sample size? Yeah, I know we're nearing about 40 million Californians, but yeah, we've remained consistent at around 1,700 California adults, and those are 18 years or older. Um, but we do weight our data to be representative statistically of the state's population, and that is something we'll keep in mind. I believe national surveys, they average about uh, just over 1,000 to 1,500 national. So that's something to keep in mind. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Wait one moment for the mics. Thank you. So that's a small sample size, but how are you choosing the people that you asked? Great question. So we conduct, it's called random digit dialing. Um, so numbers are randomly dialed. Every California has the same odds of being reached. Um, and 70% of those are contacted via cell phones. So if you see you know, an anonymous number, try to pick it up. I know most Californians and myself generally do not. Um, and 30% are conducted via landline. Yeah, this is all at random. People over the years have always asked like, why haven't I been called? And it's because there are many Californians that we're trying to reach. Yeah, perhaps a um, similar methodological question about landline versus cell phone usage, because I know landline um, pickups are higher, but also skew a lot older. So I was wondering how you thought about intergenerational difference um, across all of these, if you saw consistent trends or just on the couple that you named. Yeah, no, that's something we're always keeping in mind from a methodological standpoint and making sure we are up to date with you know what's going on nowadays. Um, previously, we even conducted, we've been increasing the amount of cell phone contacts. Um, a couple years ago, 65, a couple years prior, it was 60. And so we've been upping that in proportion to sort of, we understand that, um, younger Californians are the most likely to be reached via cell phone um, since they move around a lot, as well as other racial and uh, ethnic minority groups. So yeah, we're always staying on the forefront of that and making sure we have a representative sample. A couple questions about the interview time frame and difficulty. How long did you tell people you would keep them on the phone? Um, did the bail rate, in other words, the, the, the people that stopped somewhere in the uh, survey response or, or interview, uh, did that, has that changed over time? Yes, yeah, definitely great question. So yeah, um, so we fielded again from uh, Sunday, July 14th to Tuesday, July 23rd. Um, and we don't do the calling, we actually contract out to a company, but we do see the response rates of those who pick up and those who don't. And I can tell you for a fact, there is a continued increase in those who are not picking up their phones. And especially cell phone companies now are putting ad blockers out there and that's adding another further layer of complication of those who are picking up or not. Hi, has there ever been, I guess, interest in conducting surveys outside of phone calls, um, for example, online? Has that ever been explored or, and why or why not? Yes, great question. Um, so we have been exploring uh, online surveys. Actually, this past April, which was another special topic area, which is our Californians in Education survey, that was our first go about um, going online. And we used uh, Knowledge Panel, which is a nationwide panel um, that's representative of uh, you know, the population. And we did find very interesting findings there. And I know there also is a blog piece that we wrote about the sort of differences um, in our transition to online for that period. But that's something we're always, you know, thinking forward because telephone interviews are very costly. <laughs> okay, with that in mind, have a nice Thursday. Yeah.